Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode. This is episode three, and we are going to uh, do a playthrough of scenario one from Ringleader Victories. We uh, This is a good starting scenario for new players, as uh, it is really solo uh, intentional. There's there's no uh, choices that are made by the Raider player side, uh, so this is a good one to play uh, solo to learn the basic mechanics of the game. Uh, I, I recommend for new players to, uh, and it's, in, it's intended that you play the first uh, few scenarios in order since they build in complexity and add new layers of rules to the game. So we're going to uh, attempt to play through scenario one and I'll just walk through setup real quick. I've got most of the pieces ready to go but I want to show you how you read through and set up a starting scenario. So each scenario starts off with a background information with location, date, and some helpful information for what is uh, representing, being represented in this scenario. And then we get down to uh, the order of battle. So for the uh, defender side, we have two flights of P-40s. Um, and I've got those right over here on the wing display, ready to set up. And Remember, a single aircraft silhouette means this is a flight. This is not a squadron, but a flight. Uh, and it tells you what their mission is, what they're tasking. They're both intercept mission. So we see we've got the intercept markers on their wing display. And it tells you where they set up. So this P P40 we're going to set up in I-9. So let me go ahead and get him. sets up in I-7. So let's put him right there. And then it gives you here their max losses. So each of these flights has three aircraft in it. Small flights. It also tells you their alert status. All flights start alerted and that's indicated on their ID marker. There is an alerted side and an unalerted side. Uh, they start on their alerted side, which, uh, per the rules, intercept mission uh, units always start alerted. That is the norm. You will always see that in the scenarios. The quality, there are no veteran, green, or uh, experta markers for the defender side. So that's it. We are done with the setup for the Americans. For the Japanese, they have two squadrons of Ki-21 Sally bombers, and these are squadrons because they have the, uh, the two aircraft silhouettes, and they are going to be tasked with a bombing mission, and we're setting them up in O9, one each in O9 and P9, so I've got them set up over here. So let's go over here to O9 and P9. We see their max losses of nine, so there are nine aircraft in each of these squadrons of bombers. Their alert status is not applicable, and that's because you do not track, you do not track alert status on bombers. They do not have an alert or unalert status, and they're normally on these higher uh, alphabetical, uh, alphabetically higher ID markers that don't have an alert status, and that's just kind of a reminder for that. You don't track their alert status. Uh, we've got them set for a bombing mission, and that means they will both be carrying a bomb load. So you put one of these markers on each of the bombers. Any bombing tasked uh, aircraft unit will have a bomb load. So 
some scenarios will specify the type of bomb load, but if it's not specified, you, you use just a typical bomb load marker. There's no aircraft qu uh, crew quality markers, so we're good there. And then there's some more information down here. Um, tells you the map edges. The left side of the map will be for the, the Chinese, and the right side for the Japanese. Uh, radio nets, uh, both the P-40 flights are on radio net ABLE. Uh, the sun position is right upper, so up here in the top right corner, uh, top left map corner, we've got our sun marker in the right upper box. And any special rules then, we'll kind of go through these real quick. Uh, here explains it's to help learn the game. There's no advanced rules, but the following special rules apply. So, just reminding you, this is best played solitaire. The player controls both Chinese and Japanese units. Japanese movement is pre-programmed. Fly the squadrons to column H. On entering column H, each squadron drops its bombs by removing the bomb load marker and expends its next movement point to flip and face the Japanese map edge. Thereafter, the squadrons return to base. So these bombers will literally just fly straight all the way to column H, so right here. Then we'll remove their bomb load marker. They'll turn around and they will fly off the map. And then it says that P-40 flights cannot enter map squares in columns O to Z. So the, the flying tigers here will not be able to pursue to this column. They will have to stop here. They will not be able to pursue the bombers as they return. So we have a very short window as the Flying Tigers to stop these bombers or to interfere with them in between the N column and the H column. And then it says here that due to the scarcity of P-40s, each Chinese loss scores two EPs for the Japanese player instead of the normal one. So if you look at the aircraft data card, uh, all single engine aircraft fighters will have a, a one victory point value, uh, but these are actually going to be worth two victory points for the Japanese player for every one shot down. And then the Japanese bombers have a victory point value of two EP. And, and, and typically how that works is you'll see all fighters uh, single engine fighters have a one victory point value. If you see like a two engine fighter, usually there'll be one and a half victory points. You'll see 1.5. That's a new uh, addition to second edition. They up to the victory point value of twin engine bomb, uh, fighters. Uh, typical bombers with uh, light bombers, medium bombers will have a two VP. And the heavy bombers, once you get up to like some of the big four engines like the B-24s or b uh, B-29s will have a three victory point value. All right, so here we see our victory conditions. And you total up victory points at the end of the scenario uh, achieved by uh, air losses inflicted. And then it says, in addition, the Chinese score four VPs for each KI-21 squadron that is broken before reaching column H, or two VPs if the squadron is disrupted. So we really want to uh, force a lot of cohesion rolls on these bombers before they get to the target column of H. And then here's the victory point matrix. So just a little bit of kind of strategy thinking this over. Both of these squadrons of bombers are worth six victory points. Uh, in a normal bombing scenario, if bombers make it off the map uh, in good order, they're not disrupted or broken, they will each be worth six victory points. Um, so same is true uh, here. If they can make it to column H and drop their bombs, they will each be worth six victory points. So that's 12 victory points for the Japanese player if nothing happens in between now and the bombing column. So looking at this victory point matrix, you're going to subtract the American score from the Japanese score and then compare it on this, oh, I'm sorry, 
subtract the Japanese VPs from the Chinese VPs to see who wins. Oh, it's a little different. Okay, so no. Okay, so right now the Americans have zero VPs. Um, they will just get VPs by shooting down bombers. So that they need to score lots of kills, but also if they can disrupt or break the Japanese bombers before they reach column H, that's going to give them possibly four VPs or an extra two VPs. All right. So the last thing that we need to do as part of the setup is to place the vectors for the intercept squadrons. Each squadron or flight that is on an intercept mission must place a vector as part of the setup. Let me go ahead and get out. I think I've got to get those out ahead of time. So let me grab those real quick. And here we have for B. Alright, so there's two vector markers. And these can be placed anywhere on the map. So I'm just going to place them kind of above and in front of the bombers. Uh, you want to set up your vectors so that your interceptors will get into a good position to both tally and then engage the bombers as they close with them. All right, so setup is complete. Let's go ahead and start. Let's take a look at the sequence of play. We'll just kind of follow along so you guys can see how this works out. So we've done our setup phase by placing squadrons and uh, placing vector markers. So the first step, and these are really the, the main steps of the game, you just kind of repeat these over and over. So we start with the tally phase, Raider player first. So if the Raider player had fighters, they would go ahead and make their tally attempts first. Bombers, uh, squadrons, units with a bombing mission do not tally. They don't ever tally the enemy, and uh, so nothing for these Japanese units to uh, make a tally attempt. So we'll go to the uh, Chinese player. Uh, so we're going to attempt our tallies. All right, so let's go ahead and set this right here. Let's go ahead and take a look here. In order to successfully tally the enemy, you need to roll uh, one six-sided die and roll higher than the distance to the enemy. So if we look, for example, B here, if he wants to tally this lead bomber, he is one, two, three, four, five, six squares away, uh, six hexes, not hexes, squares, um, on a six-sided dice. So you, that's a, another big change from the first edition of the rules. Um, for those who played this game, uh, first edition victories, the rule book that came with that specified you had to roll equal to or less, uh, equal to or greater than the distance to the enemy. Uh, but now to make it harder to tally, the uh, rules that came out with Supremacy and then with 2nd Edition and all the future products, uh, you have to roll greater. And that uh, that's a backwards compatible rule uh, to be played with the 1st edition of the game. So we have to roll higher than a six, because that's our distance to the bomber. Uh, that's not exactly possible, and the only way that you could pull that off is if there were some cohesion roll modifiers that would apply, um, but none do, because our squadron, our flights are not veteran. Um, I'm sorry, that's cohesion table. Our squadrons are not veteran. Um, and there's none of these that apply at this point. Um, we don't have uh, GCI. The scenario did not specify that the flights are under GCI control, so they don't get the plus one for that. So it's really uh, not possible for these flights to tally the bombers on this first turn. All right, well, let's go ahead and move then 
to the next phase, which is the movement phase. So units move in this move order. So uh, if we had any dogfights, the dogfights would move first. We don't have any dogfights. We don't have any escorts, uh, but we do have bombers. So the bombers will go ahead and move now. And uh, movement points, the number of movement points that a unit has is determined by its mission and its alert status. So anything with a bombing mission is just gonna fly two movement points straight forward. So let's go ahead and move W first, and move him two spaces forward, and then X moves two spaces forward, that's it. That is their movement, and that is, uh, if you're not playing with the advanced rules for bombing, um, and, and a scenario will specify if, you're, if the advanced bombing rules are in effect, then bombers will just always fly straight uh, off the map, straight to their target destination. Uh, nothing, no real choices here. So now, next to move, according to our movement order, would be unalerted fighters. We don't have any unalerted fighters. Then we go to alerted fighters. So yes, that would be both our B and our C. They are alerted. And it says to move them in initiative order. And initiative order is lowest altitude first and then if you have units at the same altitude it's going to be the lowest basic speed so whatever their speed is at that altitude would break any ties lower speed moves first so let's go ahead and move now something to explain here is when you have intercept flights that have or inter intercept units with vectors they their movement is governed by having to move towards their vector and the rules uh, for uh, you have to move via the shortest route which means um, you have to at least move one uh, space closer or decrease the distance by at least one and if you're lower than your vector you have to climb at least one elevation band you can't do any movement that would increase the distance from your vector, but beyond that, you don't have to move as close as possible. You just have to decrease the distance by at least one and increase your elevation by one. So let's start here with the lowest altitude, which is going to be flight C. Flight C is at altitude seven. So if we look at the aircraft data card, um, he falls within this altitude band right here, four to nine. So it's gonna cost him two movement points to climb one elevation. So let's go ahead and start with C. For his, uh, he has three movement points, all alerted um, fighters in the game can move three movement points. Uh, the interceptors get three movement points. So he is going to start by moving into this square right here because this is decreasing the distance by one to his vector and it's also increasing his elevation by one so that would this movement would satisfy the movement requirement for uh, him having a, a vector on the map now with movement thing to keep in mind is you always move you can only move into the square you're facing so I can't just move him like this um, because rules specify you always move into the squares you are facing. So for him to move up here, he needs to change his facing, rotate towards the square, and then move into it. So if the change in facing is less than 180 degrees, it's a free movement. It's a free facing change immediately before you move. You get to freely change your facing immediately before entering a square. So for him to rotate 45 degrees and then move, that's free, and then to move into this square is two movement points. He has one more movement point to spend, so he could he could not fly up here because that's another two movement points and he only has one movement point left. So we're just going to uh, rotate him 45 back down and then just move him into this square. So that's his three movement points he's moved. Let's go to B now. B has a vector and he's below it, so he has to move closer and higher. So we'll do the same thing with him. We'll spend uh, two movement points to rotate for free and climb. 
and then a third movement point to rotate down and then fly right here. Now because they both uh, climbed during the movement phase, we are going to mark them with a climb marker. And this will stay on them uh, until they spend a movement phase where they are not climbing. And likewise, if they decrease their elevation, they're going to get marked with a dive marker. Okay, so that is the movement phase. The next step is combat phase, but combat only occurs when you have units of opposing sides in the same square and one at least one of them has a tally on the other side so we have no combat so we skip that and then we go to administration phase but there's nothing for us to do here so we're going to go to end turn it's now turn two which you would mark that over here on the left side of the map and this isn't super important since there's there's no reinforcements or anything to keep track of uh, but just just to be thorough, we'll put the turn marker up there. We're now on turn two. So we don't have any setup to do, we go to the tally phase. All right, so again, Raider doesn't tally, but we are now able to tally here. So let's go ahead and have our, uh, let's have our C flight try to tally uh, Japanese Squadron W. So the distance is two, he needs to roll higher than two. And, uh, Let's check the, the tally modifiers. Notice it says that there's a negative modifier possible for weather. And we have a sun. Uh, the sun arc is in the right upper. So if we look at the back of our, of our rule book here, you're going to see the sun arc chart. So the sun arc is always uh, in relation to each unit. So each unit will have th this sun arc because the sun is in the right upper um, spot. We're going to check to see if targets are in the sun and it's relative to each aircraft. So for C here, if we check this chart. Uh, these first two squares right here are in the sun for him. So if we look, that would be these two squares. So squadron W actually is in the sun relative to C. And what that means is there's going to be a minus one modifier uh, to his tally roll if he tries to tally W, because W is in the sun. These squares right here, and then the sun arc goes up, over two, up, over two. X is not in the sun, so uh, if he tries to tally X instead, he does not have that sun arc modifier to deal with. So essentially, because trying to tally him is going to apply a minus one modifier, and X does not get it, it's going to be the same chance for C to tally either one of them. So we'll just have him try to tally W. So we'll pick up one six-sided die, give this a roll, and we roll two. So two... Uh, minus one for the sun arc means it's a one, so we, we failed to tally. And C only gets one tally attempt. He cannot now try to tally X. That was his one tally attempt. He is not allowed any more this turn. Let's go ahead and have B. We'll have him try to make a tally. We'll have him try to tally W as well. So here we go. We need to roll a two or less. There's no sun arc to worry about here because the enemy is below. So we'll roll one six-sided dice here, and we get a two, which unfortunately is not enough. We needed to roll higher than the distance, so we failed our tally roll. This is not good. We really needed a tally early on to uh, get a better chance to succeed at this scenario, but we'll play it by the rules, and we'll show you how this goes. All right, so we've got the tally phase, go to the movement phase. Our bombers move first, so we'll go ahead and have them move their two squares forward. And now we will have our interceptors move. 
So we're going to have uh, C move first because he's the lower altitude. Uh, he's at elevation 9, so he's going to cost 2 movement points to climb. So he's going to spend 2 movement points to rotate up like this and fly up into this square. Now he's got one more movement point. He does not have to move. He can stay circle. He can circle with that last movement point and stay here, which is exactly what I want to do. I want to flip him around, leave him in this square, but face him this way, and that way I don't get any negative modifiers when trying to tally someone behind me. So I'm rotating him to face left, and that is legal because I've, I've, I've satisfied the shortest distance rule of getting closer and climbing one elevation band. So he is, he can just stop in this square right here. Now if he, if he fails to tally this next turn, he's going to have to keep moving towards his vector. Uh, but for now he's going to stop right here. And he's still climbed, so we're keeping the climb marker on him. Now B, uh, he is now on the same altitude with his vector, so he does not have to climb or dive. In fact, he cannot. He cannot. He has to stay on his elevation with his vector. He's going to spend one movement point to fly one square closer, and that satisfies all the movement he needs to do. He still has two movement points left, so he, I'm actually just going to have him circle here, but I'm going to turn him around and face him towards the enemy so that he can easily tally them next turn. All right. That's turn two. Let's go to turn three. Uh, back up here to the tally phase, right? We didn't have any combat again, and this is a good example of this. Even though C is in the same square with X, he does not have a tally on X, so no combat occurs. No combat occurs. And remember, bombers don't place tallies, and they cannot initiate combat, so no combat takes place. So we're back up to the tally phase now for turn three. All right, now we have some really good op uh, opportunities here to tally. Let's start with C. He's in the same square with X, so he needs to roll greater than his distance to tally X. Well, it's distance zero, so he needs to roll one or higher. Well, it's impossible to miss. We won't even bother rolling. We'll just take his vector marker, we'll flip it to its tally side, and we'll place it on X. So C has a tally on X now. And then B, we're going to have him try to tally W. So he needs to roll higher than his distance of 1 from W. So come on, let's get a good roll here. Alright, we got a 3. So we have a successful tally. We're going to take his vector marker, flip it to its tally side, and put it on W. All right, tally phase is complete. Let's move to the combat phase. I'm sorry, movement phase. So the bombers move first. We're getting pretty close to the H column here. So this is really cutting it close for trying to disrupt these bombers before they drop their bombs. We'll have W move first. One, two. Now remember, we have a special tally rule during the movement phase, and that is right after a squadron or, or flight moves, if anyone has a tally on it, they will immediately move right after their tallied target moves. So even though X normally would move next because he's a bomber, uh, we're going to have B move right now because he has a tally on W. So here we go. He has three movement points. Now he is going to be diving this turn. Uh, whenever you dive with a fighter, he is going to get uh, plus one to his movement value. So really he's going to be getting four movement points. And just so long as we dive at any point during the game or during the turn, we're going to get that plus one movement for this turn. So he has four movement points. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and have him come one, two. Now he's got two more movement points to play with. And I'm going to go ahead and illustration purposes, I'm going to show you an advanced rule here. I'm going to show you a bounce. Um, partly because it's good to see how it works, but also because I really need <laughs> I need the best combat opportunity here possible to inflict damage on this W. So, if a interceptor, in, in, in this case, if he can attack from out of the sun, meaning he enters this square 
from a square that is in W's sun arc, or is relative to W, which would be this square and this square. And if he spent two movement points in the sun relative to W, immediately before moving in, he's going to qualify as coming as attacking from out of the sun, and that's going to give him a bounce modifier. Uh, so he's using the sun to attack W, attacking out of the sun. So he has spent one movement point moving here. That's one movement point in the sun. And then moving here is another movement point in the sun because these squares are in the sun relative to W. So he's he spent two movement points in the sun, which is the qualification to bounce. And now he has to have done that immediately before moving into W. So now we're going to rotate him 45 degrees down. And for a third movement point, he's going to fly down in here. Now he has a fourth movement point, but the tally rule for movement uh, specifies that when you enter your tallied target square, you must stop. You cannot move any further. So he did not climb. He dove this turn. So we're going to go ahead and flip this to the dive side and mark B with a dive marker. Okay, now let's go ahead and have X move. So X is going to fly two spaces forward and that triggers C's movement. He is the last one to move anyways. So he's gonna get three movement points and we're just gonna have him attack by moving one, two. And he has to stop because he entered his tallied target square. So no more movement points he can spend. And he, we're gonna remove his climb marker because he did not climb, he did not dive. Uh, so this will just come off. All right. So movement is complete. Let's go ahead and resolve combat. We have two separate combats to resolve here. Let's go ahead and start with let's start with this rear one so you can see the difference with the bounce. We'll save the best for last. So combat between C and X. I'm going to put the aircraft data cards up here so you can see how we resolve this. So the first thing in any combat is to determine who is the attacker, who is the defender. Now, whenever a bomber is involved in combat, the side that owns the bomber is always the defender. So even if we had uh, some, some Japanese fighters involved in this combat as well, um, they're always going to be the defender because they have bombers involved. So just because of the bomber there, we know that P-40B is the attacker. Um, so he gets to choose as the attacker whether he's going to use speed or turn as the rating or the type of combat we're going to use. Are we going to use hit and run uh, using the speed values or are we going to do a turning fight using the turn values? So we're at elevation 9, um, which if you look here, the P-40 has the same speed and turn rating at this altitude. Um, as does the bombers. So initially it looks like there's no advantage to going either or, but there is because um, if we look at the combat table for the defender, he gets his defense rating increased by two if it's a turning fight, if he's defending with a defense rating. And you can see that, I'm oh, sorry, their, yeah, their defense rating. So the bombers have a defense rating. This is a indicator of they have gunners on their aircraft. Uh, so it's a zero, which means in a normal combat, uh, just they have uh, a modifier of zero for the combat. But if it's a turning fight, that gets increased by two in a turning fight. So that would raise this to a two, which means they're gonna get a plus two to their combat roll. So we want to avoid a turning fight against bombers because we do not like that defense rating boost for defenders against uh, a turn fight. So we're going to choose speed. Speed is just the way to go against bombers. It just is to avoid that nasty defense modifier. So he has a speed of five and if we look uh, up here at our modifiers we see here um, we're not marked with a bomb load, we're not diving, we're not climbing. So right now he is just a base value of 5. When we come over here, um, he's not veteran, 
Uh, there's no additional squadrons or flights participating. Um, he's not green. He is a flight. Right? We're a flight, not a squadron. So we get minus one to our combat value. So this drops down to a four. Um, and that's all that applies. So his speed combat value is going to be a four. It's five minus one because he's a flight. Now the Japanese squadron, he has a speed value of three. And if we look over here, he is marked with a bomb load marker. Right, you see that on the wing display. It's a bomb load marker, so he has minus one to his speed and turn. So his base three is going to go down to a two because he's carrying a bomb load marker. Uh, but none of these other ones are going to apply. He's not veteran or green, and he's not a flight. So these are going to be the values that we use for the combat. So the P-40B has a speed of four versus the two for the bomber. So this means the American player, I'm sorry, the Chinese player, is going to roll on the combat column that is on the plus two because he is two higher than the combat value of the bomber. So the American, the, the Chinese fighters, will roll on this column and the Japanese will defend using the minus two column. All right, so let's go ahead and we'll roll for the American player. For the, I keep stop saying that. They're flying tigers, they're American pilots, but they're flying for the Chinese. All right, here we go. Here goes the combat roll. And you can do this in any order. There's no, there's, this combat is considered simultaneous. So you can resolve these in any order. Let's start with the Chinese roll. not good roll of five. Let's check the modifiers here. So this is not a head-on combat, no evasion, no bounce, no experta, no gyro gun sights, no weather modifier. So it's just a straight up five. If we look on the plus two column, a five is no hits. So no hits scored by the Flying Tigers on the Japanese. Now let's go ahead and have the Japanese roll for their combat using the minus two column. All right, and they rolled quite high, 10. And if we look at their defender die roll modifiers, uh, there are none that apply here. Uh, the defense rating would get applied, but it's a defense rating of zero. Uh, so it stays at zero, nothing to add there. So 10 on the minus two column is one hit. So they score one hit. We're going to confirm that hit. So using the losses chart here, we roll one die for each hit. And we're gonna modify that and compare it to the protection rating of the P40. So here goes confirmation. And we roll a one. All right, a one is an automatic no effect. So even if the modifiers were to raise this to match or exceed the protection value, it does not apply. A one is an automatic no effect. So just paint got nicked on the P40. A six would be an automatic kill. Uh, ignoring the protection rating of the aircraft, it would just be an automatic kill. So thankfully, we don't have any casualties here. All right, so we've resolved combat rolls for both the attacker and the defender. The last thing to do here is to check cohesion. So even though we failed to inflict losses on the bombers, hopefully we can inflict some cohesion hits or some, uh, some disruption on the bombers. So both, all combatants, will have to make a disruption roll. So we'll go ahead and start with, with Flight C, the, American, the Japanese, and I'll start with the Japanese squadron. So we'll roll. 2d6 and check the cohesion table on the bomber column to see if we can get any cohesion or any disruption. And no. So we rolled a 7. Uh, there's no modifiers that apply, so a 7 on the bomber is no disruption. So that's unfortunate. Let's go ahead and roll for the P40s. Let's check their cohesion. And that is not good. This is awful. Okay, so two, and look at the modifiers here. 
Um, the squadron is on the attacking side in the combat, and that is true, because the P-40 was the attacker, so he gets plus one to his cohesion roll, so that goes up to a three, and no other modifiers. So a three on the fighter column is two levels of disruption. You only need one level of disruption to break a flight. It takes two levels of disruption to break a squadron. So C is broken. So we're going to mark him with a broken. Um, and that means he loses his mission. He's no longer tasked with anything. He is going to leave the map and head home. So, And he would be marked at the end of combat with a minus one low ammo marker but there's no point in marking it because he's already broken and that's the whole point of these ammo markers is to affect future cohesion rolls and he's already broken so there's really no point in tracking it all right well, that was that was bad that was really bad for the flying tiger so let's see if we can do any better with this combat situation uh, but for sake of time, we're at 40 minutes. I'm going to go ahead and pause the video here. We will continue uh, in the next video resolving this all-important combat here in Square I-9. So we'll go ahead and stop the video here. Thanks for watching. We will continue this soon.